Hi you it's um, so this is our first uh, home video I'm looking at Warhorse because you guys have an assessment coming up uh, so I'm going to talk about your assessment it is uh, an essay normally a character or thematic essay so let's have a look as I've said we have either a character thematic essay uh, the essay is worth 40 marks why are you doing this? Because this is practice for your literature exam. There's three sections in, in the GCSE literature exam, which the year 11s will be doing in a few weeks. And the, the third piece of writing they have to do is called prose writing. And it's worth 40 marks, and they get about 45 minutes to do, to do it. Uh, here are the assessment objectives. A01, you need to have a critical knowledge of the text. That's 20 marks. Critical knowledge means that you don't just you have to you have to know the book throughout, not just up to chapter four or something like that. You have to know what the, the, the whole span of the book. Um, as well as that, you need to be aware of writer's craft. You know the whole Peter stuff where you foreground, and this is done through the writer's use of figurative language or characterization, whatever it happens to be. Um, so that's twenty marks will do critical knowledge of the text. Another 20 marks goes to an awareness of context. And I would say an integration of context into your argument. Um, we've done a little bit about this. Context basically means a few things. It can be, for example, Michael Morpurgo's own uh, autobiographical details, how his own life uh, influenced what is in this novel. Uh, people that he met, their stories, paintings, photographs he, he saw. Um, other books that influenced him. The genre of this is historical realism. Um, so we'll, we'll look at that later on. As I say, 20 marks go to context, so you have to integrate context. So once you've got to make your points about all of these things, don't remember, or don't forget, sorry, to, to tag on. And this reflects Michael Morpurgo's own uh, life when he there was a distance with his own father, or something like that, or uh, which is reminiscent of uh, much of the conflict in World War One. Okay, or which is reminiscent of the class structure in Edwardian England. Okay, so these are things to be aware of. Um, but let's get down to your choices. Uh, you, it's normally either a character essay or a thematic essay. We'll look at character first of all. So, for character, um, well, let's take character um, Albert's dad, Ted Narricott. So with any character, you consider the first impressions of that character <clears throat> and what kind of, what role they play, what archetype are they? I mean, are they a protagonist? Are they, are they the central main hero of the novel? Are they an are they an antagonist? Are they there to cause um, conflict? Are they a supporting character? There's a whole range of archetypes, uh, types of characters that, and roles that um, people fulfill in novels. So think about that. Then you need to have a good range of personality adjectives. So sticking with Ted Narricott, for example, uh, at the start he's quite rash. He is. Um, he's an alcoholic, he is irresponsible, he is uh, quick to anger, um, and he, so these are, these are many, many um, adjectives that you could use when describing a, a character. Uh, but of course, don't just make a point, if you're saying for example that he's irresponsible, you need to find quotations to back it up. Then you consider their development. Uh, some characters are quite static, quite two-dimensional, they don't develop very much. Um, now, from chapter one to chapter four, you could say that about um, Albert's father, about Ted Narricott. However, uh, later on, around chapter 18, we get to hear, uh, chapter 18, chapter 19, we get to hear uh, some redeeming features about him, where uh, he felt bad, he stopped drinking, he changed a lot, he was a lot more supportive toward the mother, making jokes with Albert. Uh, so you get to hear some progression with this character. 
um, contribution to the text. Now, this, I'm trying, this could be for any character, but we take Ted Narakot. He is a vehicle for certainly the theme of, uh, of conflict, of the effect of war. Uh, there are some hints that he fought in, I think it was the, I hope I get my dates right. I think it was the Boer War. Uh, there's, there's, uh, anyway, he was involved in war himself, and, and there's a suggestion, certainly in the movie, that this has uh, affected him, that this might be one of the reasons why he uh, is an alcoholic and has all these different uh, flaws as a result of that. Um, so he's a vehicle for that. Uh, you could also see, see uh, he, what does the character help create? Um, he helps to create a lot of conflict, especially in the first four chapters. Uh, there's family tension, there's a, a lot of tension between him and his son. Um, basically, Albert loves Joey and, uh, you know, has to, there's, there's an awful lot of rising action. He has to, he has to um, get a racing horse to plow a field to try and um, help rescue his, his father's home. Um, and then, of course, there's ups and there's you know there's there's micro events and macro events. There's there's where his father threatens to shoot Joey at one stage, and then of course there, at once there's that sort of um, uh, anticlimactic sense when they, they do win, they do plow the field successfully, but then of course he hears that uh, his father has gone and sold him off to the army, which is devastating. So. Um, Definitely, having Ted Narakot as a character makes the story very uh, dramatic, very intriguing, and it's full of uh, tension and conflict. Uh, who does he act as a foil for? He definitely acts as a foil for his son. His son is um, more patient, more responsible, more caring, uh, so definitely uh, Albert's father's irrationality, his rash behaviour, his irresponsible behaviour, his impatience, his cruelty uh, definitely is a foil to Albert. So these are ways to consider a character. Moving on from that we have themes. You might be, get, you might be given a thematic question. So first thing with the theme you have to unpack it and interpret it in more than one sense. That's what higher uh, uh, candidates will do. Candidates that score higher marks. So, for example, I'll give you a que sample question, which we'll look at in more detail after. Uh, how does how is the theme of conflict addressed in Warhorse? Okay. So you would just go conflict in your bubble, and you'd go, okay, what 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 do we mean by conflict? So obviously, conflict is war. So you you know, war, and then you would think of the various scenes throughout various chapters, that there's some really great descriptive scenes of the chaos and horror of war, especially what it does to nature, especially what it does to the men and the horses. Um, then, of course, there are other kinds of conflict. There is, again, the first four chapters, there is the, there's the conflict within the family, there is economic conflict, there about to lose their home, so the, the, which addresses uh, also a, a themes of, of class and poverty. Um, so uh, there's also uh, conflict between uh, some of the other custodians of Joey. Joey's handed on to many, many different people, and you get a sense of rank and different um, and position and different personalities. So. It's, it's, it's how you, you, you deal with, uh, with the theme and how you unpack it. Um, so as I said, think of incidents throughout the book. Don't just focus on, a, on one or two chapters, okay? You need to be looking for examples throughout the text. Um, then develop it from a topic into an argument. Don't fall into this trap where you're just ending every paragraph by saying, oh, and this addresses conflict, and this addresses conflict, and this addresses conflict, okay? You have to flesh it out until more than that, until a kind of an argument. So, for example, instead of just saying um, the the arguments between um, the arguments between Ted Narakot and his son also address the theme of conflict. 
that's just having a topic. You need to flesh it out into more than that. So for example, the arguments between uh, Ted and Aricot and Albert um, reflect the theme of conflict in several ways. For example, um, his father's possible post-traumatic stress disorder from, from the previous war has left him dependent on alcohol. Um, in addition to that, their, um, their indentured position as, as tenants for the particular landlord, that is always hanging over them, that's a type of conflict. Um, so, and, and these serve as a forerunner for the more wider conflict of World War I that is fast approaching. Something like that. You have to kind of flesh it out. Don't just say, and this addresses conflict, and this addresses conflict, and this addresses conflict. That's just one word. That's not a fleshed out theme or an argument. Um, look for patterns and parallels. So, uh, as I said, uh, there are many, many different descriptions of uh, the battle scenes. And the way they are described, irrespective of whether it's from the point of view of the Germans or the Allies, uh, you will see deliberate echoing and mirroring, mirroring and parallel bits of dialogue or parallel uh, examples of figurative language. You'll, you'll, you'll know, you'll go, oh, I've heard this before. And he does that deliberately. Um, and that's to try and say that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a universal thing. Irrespective of what side of the war you're on, uh, there's a common humanity there. Um, so these are the sort of tricks that a writer will use. Getting into that writer's craft, um, you have to foreground all your points by uh, talking about, you know, the writer's use of characterization. Say, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that soldier. Um, I know Mad Friedrich, or I keep going back to I keep going back to um, uh, Albert's father. I'm going to stick with Albert's father. Uh, use of characterization, uh, even stuff like pathetic fallacy, uh, when they're when they're first going over by boat, the way it describes the, the weather, the atmosphere. It's very foreboding. You know that something, you know that something bad's about to happen. Uh, dialogue, whatever it happens to be, it could be figurative language, it could be ironic devices. Uh, there's an interesting one, yeah, like, um, for example, um, dramatic and even situational irony, because right at the end of chapter four, we get to hear from Albert's mom. Everyone else seems to be saying, oh, it'll be over in a, in a, in a few weeks. Everyone seems to think that this war will be um, not very long lasting. But the way it describes the mother looking out, you can tell that she does not think the same, that she actually thinks it's going to be very, very serious. Uh, so little things like that, that would be characterization. Um, and finally, uh, um, consider all these things at a, at a micro level. So, you know, the family conflicts, the, the struggles to save the house. Then there's at a macro level, um, you know, at a society level, uh, where you have the Germans against the French and the Belgians and, and, and the British. Um, and then there's these universal lessons, you know. Um, what what can we learn from that? From the what what is the writer's intent? What's the writer's purpose? Uh, what um, should then that's also that's your own contribution. What do you think? You know, people may have different contributions. But uh, for example, what you can take from this is that uh, we should not. Um, casually or too easily be led into to conflict because of um, uh, patriotic propaganda or something like that. You know what I mean? There has to we, we need to learn the the, the lessons from, from from history. These sorts of things. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, I will be looking at how to break down. I'm going to do a sample essay on conflict, just how it's structured. Um, and then what you will, I want you guys to practice it and then you will be getting a, 
a different essay in the coming weeks. Thank you very much.